I want to begin with a prayer. Today we're going to talk about wealth and treasure, what everyone wishes for and few of us have. But we're going to talk about a windfall of riches. But before we do that, I want to, to uh, share a prayer with you. I'm going to read a prayer. It's from the Apostle Paul. Um, he prayed this for the Ephesians in the first century, and it's recorded in, in the letter to the Ephesians, the first chapter. It's a prayer that is also for the church at large, not just the Ephesians, but to the church through all the ages, and specifically today. Uh, all the way here to Vallejo Drive Church in 2024. And this is the prayer. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know the hope to which he has called you. How rich and glorious is his inheritance in the saints. How immeasurably great is the power that he has exercised toward those who have faith. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. First, the story. Now, we're going uh, in the series that Pastor Jonathan has started uh, uh, in his next new now. And today, we're focusing on a story from 2 Kings 7. I call it Windfall. So from last week, you might remember, the city of Samaria is under siege. That's kind of how we left it. There's no one in and no one out. We don't live in a time so much of siege, except, yes, we do. Think of Ukraine and the siege that, uh, that Russia has laid to many cities in Ukraine and other, other modern examples of warfare. No one in and no one out. There's no f food supplies in the city. There's no way to get food in. Disease and death are rampant and hope is gone. Except for four scroungy outcasts. The Bible says they're lepers. The word for leper in the Old Testament really describes a broad range of, of uh, skin diseases and even people who have been uh, kind of excommunicated from the community because of whatever reason. They're out. They're outsiders. outsiders they're outcasts. They were unclean. They were untouchable. And they were outside of the city. The only way they got food was if they got garbage thrown over the side of the city walls, but there's no garbage because there's no food and there's no anything. So here's the story. And we'll just read through it. Second Kings chapter 7, starting with verse 3. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. If we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. Remember, the Arameans are the army that have the city surrounded. So they're going to go surrender, and maybe, maybe the Arameans will want to use them for uh, uh, you know, intelligence reports, and they might get some food there, or maybe they'll kill them. But they figure we're going to die no matter what. Let's, let's take charge of how we die, so to speak. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. It's a statement of resignation based on hopeless desperation. But they came up with this idea, what do we have to lose? Kind of like uh, Naaman's servants suggested to him earlier in, in uh, this whole series when uh, Naaman, the general, had leprosy and he didn't want to dip into the river Jordan. His servant said, look, Naaman, what do you have to lose? Just do it. Just do it. So that's what they did. Verse 5, at dusk they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. No one was there. <laughs> For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and the Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. Remember how the story of uh, uh, previously of Elijah in Dothan? And the, the town of Dothan was surrounded by the Aramean army and uh, Elijah prayed that his servant would, would have his eyes open 
would have his eyes open to see the hosts of heaven's armies surrounding the Aramean army. Well, I guess the host of heaven's army chased the Arameans away from Samaria as well. Verse 8, the men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents, and ate and drank. They struck it rich. Then they took silver and gold and clothes and went off and hid them. Well, what are soldiers doing with silver and gold and clothes? I thought they were in battle. Well, they'd been in many battles, and in ancient times when they would win, when they would overtake a city and defeat an army, they would get all the good stuff and keep it for themselves. And so as they go along, they have this accumulation of wealth. They took their silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. Smart guys, right? We'd probably do the same. If we were starving, if we were quarantined, we found food and we found wealth, so we'll get our bellies full and then we have the wealth and maybe we can turn things around in our lives. Then they said, this is verse 9, then they said to each other, what we're doing is not right. Interesting. These guys are outcasts. Nobody wants them around. They're untouchable, and they have a conscience. <laughs> we are not doing the right thing. But notice what the conscience is about. This is a day of what? Good news. Good news. And we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let us go at once and report this to the royal palace. Good news, good news indeed. Sound familiar in, the, in this series? The woman of Shunem who got good news when Elisha told her she was going to have a baby. And she did. The good news she had again when she found out that her, her son who died was going to be brought back to life when he was brought back to life. That was good news. The Israelite servant girl gave good news to Naaman when she told him about a solution for his leprosy and Naaman had great news when he found out his leprosy was gone after he did what God's prophet told him to do. It was good news when Elisha's servant saw that God, when God opened the eyes of Elisha's servant to see the armies of heaven surrounding the enemy soldiers at Dothan. And now the four outcasts realize they have good news to give to the starving, dying city of Samaria. Verse 10 says, So they went and called out to the gatekeepers and told them, We went into the Aramean camp, and no one was there. Not a sound of anyone, only tethered horses and donkeys, and the tents left just as they were. The gatekeepers shouted the news, and it was reported within the palace. I'll leave it to Pastor Jonathan to tell you what happens next. But you can imagine what happened next. The rejoicing that was taking place. Have you ever had a windfall? You don't have to hold your hand up. Anybody here ever win the lottery? I mean, win the lottery big? Don't raise your hand because we'll be asking for money. <laughs> Diane and I had a windfall last year. Several windfalls. I, I, I kind of debated whether or not I wanted to tell. I'll tell you about one of them. We, uh, it was, it was probably the hottest streak in August and uh, we live in Banning which is kind of a, a, at about uh, 2600 feet elevation so sometimes it's cooler sometimes it's hotter it's in between the desert and the mountains and you know the Inland Empire and so forth but it was really hot and it was really humid and in the midst of that heat our air conditioner went out it went out and we had just began working on a plan to, to uh, um, get a new quilt machine for Diana because some of you know that she does quilts all day long, every day, making baby quilts for all over Southern California. If she had the energy, it would be, she'd cover the world in quilts. And she really needed uh, a new one that would keep up with the demand. And so the air conditioner goes out. You, you know, you know. If an air conditioner goes out, what it is, right? It's money. And we didn't have money. And so uh, 
so we just prayed, God, just, just help us. Help us to, to do the right thing and to, to, you know, keep cool one way or another. We turned on fans. We opened the windows at night. Uh, I thought about getting a bowl of ice and putting the fan in front of it right by my bed. I didn't do that, but... Um, and, and we, shared, we shared with some friends our situation, and uh, we were, happened to be at the Bible Lab that weekend, and people at the Bible Lab said, oh, I have an air conditioner you can take home, and you can do, uh, use it until you get something. And, uh, and then we had, I, somehow our small group had found out that we had this difficulty. We have, a, we have a, um, <laughs> an old people's small group come from my former church in North Hills, and we've all kind of moved away different places here in Southern California, but on a regular basis, we get together to share what God's been doing in our lives, to pray together, study the Bible, and always, always eat, you know, lots of food. And so, um, I can't remember what day it was, but uh, Diana came in with the mail, and she she just, she just handed me a card and didn't say anything. I said, what's this? She said, just, just look at it. I opened the card, and here was a, a beautiful message from our small group and saying, saying, we wanted to help you with your air conditioner. And there was a check in, in, the, uh, in the envelope for, uh, well, as much as our air conditioner costs, several thousand dollars. Now, I'm, I, I'm not in a small group of, of people who've won the lottery, let me tell you. We've all had our struggles, and we all, we've all had our ups and downs, and I, I can tell you that both Diane and I just started crying right at that moment. It may not be huge, but it was huge to us at that moment. It was a windfall, something we didn't expect, something we didn't earn or deserve in any way. It just came to us out, out of the goodness and the kindness of our friends and out of the grace of God. So what does this story have to do with us? Let's talk about the good news, which we call, from the New Testament, the gospel, right? The good news. The Apostle Paul frames the gospel in terms of grace. Grace, a windfall of unexpected, unearned, and undeserved wealth or favor. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 2, uh, verses 4, 6, and 7. And there's so much in Ephesians. I would just, I would encourage you, if you have an inkling or a, an interest in Bible study, just take the book of Ephesians and read it and reread it and reread it. In that book is some of the best, the, the best information and the best inspiration anywhere in the New Testament. And this is what he says, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. When you are baptized and you come out of the water, the Bible says you've come from death to life because even though we're living and breathing and walking around without Jesus, we're as good as dead. That's just the way it is. Because from the moment our parents in the Garden of Eden, you know, took the bite out of the fruit, they disobeyed God, the race has been dying ever since. You have been raised from the dead with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly realm. So God can point to us. This is why. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. I know this sounds like a lot of uh, high-tone religious talk, but today I want you to consider that when the Bible talks about the riches of grace, when it talks about the wealth of God's goodness, when it talks about the windfall of his mercy, it's talking in tangible and real terms. So let's, first of all, let's look at the word grace. We use grace in a general way to cover a couple of things. Uh, and sometimes we use, use, the, use them interchangeably, but I like to separate 
uh, the meaning of the word grace. I like to separate it out. First of all is mercy. We talk about mercy. The word in Greek is elios. I'm not a Greek scholar, so if I mispronounce it to any Greek people, you can yell at me later, as one of my uh, members at North Hills used to do. <laughs> he was Greek, and he would, he would call me up and say, you didn't spell that, you didn't say the word right. I'll tell you how to say it. You know. Elios, mercy, it means pity or compassion. Basically, mercy is being treated better than you deserve to be treated. The mercy of God to us. He treats us not according to our sins, according to David in, in uh, Psalm 103. He, tr he treats us with mercy. And then this other word, charis, charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, which means gift, literally means a gift. And that is being given what we did not earn and what we did not expect. The gift of God to us is unearned and it's unexpected in many respects. How could, we, how could we ever deserve the gift that God has given to us? Then in Ephesians 1.14, uh, man, Ephesians 1 is so full. You know, when you study the Bible, take time. Just go through the verses. We have, we have the most amazing tools available to us today of any generation on the face of the earth. We know more archaeology, we know more history, we know more about the culture, the language, the customs uh, of ancient times, of Jesus' day, of Elisha's day, and, and farther back than that. And so you can go on to, go on to Wikipedia, it's the great theological resource in the world. Uh, or you can go, uh, go to Bible Gateway, you have uh, uh, scores and scores of different versions, how, how the... Uh, how the passage is translated. Uh, you, can, you can delve into the background, into the history. And so when you study the Bible, don't just pass over the words. There's a reason why those words are in the Bible. There's a reason why these stories are in the Bible because God, in his great wisdom, oversaw what we have today as this collection of writings we call the Bible. Over 60 authors writing over 2,000 years and look at the incredible Truth that just flows through from one book to another. Ephesians 1.14 says the Spirit, the Spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit, is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised that he, and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. God's guarantee, that word guarantee is a, is a, a, a word araban. It means uh, a security payment. God has put a down payment on our inheritance by giving us the Holy Spirit so that we won't get discouraged. It's like, I, you, you have no idea what I have in mind for you in heaven, but right now I'm going to give you something that is going to just blow your mind as well, the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that. We possess, according to Ephesians, and other places in the New, New Testament, we possess the riches of the kingdom through the gift or the charisma of the Holy Spirit. So let's go back to this prayer in Ephesians 1 of Paul. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glory, glorious inheritance in his people. Notice the focus he has on wealth and riches of the gospel. And again, two words. And this will be the last words, I think, pretty much. But you bear with me. No, learn, okay? Just learn. Just do that. Plut uh, I think it's plautos, wealth and opulence. Riches beyond imagination. That's what God has given to us through the Holy Spirit. Or uh, the second word is clero kleronomia, inheritance, inheritance. Inheritance is a legal guarantee of this wealth. It's not just, uh, oh, I think I might have an inheritance. I'm going to go see if I can visit my rich uncle. No, it's your rich uncle, removed five times in five generations, who has somehow left you an inheritance of some great and beautiful estate in Ireland. Well, that's my dream. I don't know what yours is. 
And I, it's really not a dream because, you know, if you get an estate that, that beautiful and that big, it's going to require about 100 people to run it and take care of it. So uh, two, these two words that mean wealth and opulence, opulent wealth, riches beyond imagination, and an inheritance, he says, I want you to, I want you to be enlightened. I want you to have your eyes open so that you will realize that, that God has given you hope through the riches of his glorious inheritance to his holy people who he has created and now he has redeemed through this, uh, the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And when we think of wealth, we think of money, right? Pretty much. I mean, you have possessions and houses, but you can buy stuff with money. Buy whatever you want with money. So, I, I was thinking about this. If I were to offer today a $1,000 bill, I know this is on worldwide broadcast, so I'm, this is just an if. Just If I were to offer a $1,000 bill to whoever showed up first next week at church, you think we'd have a crowd at the door? We might have to call the cops out and have, have them separate the, the Christians fighting over that $1,000 bill. I don't know. But Paul talks about the gospel in terms that make $1,000 look like a penny or less because it all centers on the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what the Holy Spirit brings? You know, the Bible, we have, we have teaching in, in the Christian church and in the Adventist church about the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we misinterpret that and think that the fruit is like there's a whole bunch of fruits. It's a tree with all these fruits. No, he's, he's basically saying, no, the Holy Spirit, when he, when he comes and you, you open your life to him, when you listen to God's Holy Spirit, when you allow him to, to turn your life around from going away from God, which is basically going to hell, and going towards God, which is basically going to eternal life, when you allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life, the Holy Spirit will begin to produce his character, God's character in your life. And God's character is characterized by the fruits, or the fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, temperance. Oh, that's an old word, sorry. Self-control. <laughs> the love of God begins to permeate your life, and the Holy Spirit begins to work on you so that in every area of your life you begin to represent Jesus. We can't say, well, I have the fruit of patience, but I have, I have no joy. It doesn't work that way. If you have God, you've got to have joy. If you have Jesus, you've got to have love. God is bringing you to full maturity in Christ. That's what Paul says in the book of Romans. And, and then there's the gifts, gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are things like preaching, and teaching. The Bible says prophecy is a gift. The Bible says that helping others is a gift. That speaking in ecstatic utterances is a gift. I don't know what that means exactly, but sometimes, like today, listening to the worship, I just was overwhelmed with God's greatness and his goodness. Do you ever feel like you have no words to express what God is doing for you and what he's done for you? There's, there's so many gifts. There's leadership. There's administration. There's all kinds of gifts. And the list is probably much bigger than the few that the Bible uh, enumerates. And so the wealth of the gospel, the wealth of the gospel all centers on this gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gave to us. He told his disciples, look, I'm going away, but I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit. He's going to be right beside you. He's going to be your, your friend, your counselor, your comforter. He's going to be the one who, who tells you when, you when you're right and wrong. He'll be your guide. He'll be your teacher. He'll be everything you need to keep you connected with me. And he will bring you into community as a body. How valuable do you think the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit are. Well, let's go back to where the good news originated in the New Testament. Jesus' life. Early in his ministry, 
Jesus went to church one Sabbath in his hometown, Nazareth. Now, you might think that a guy coming home to his hometown, young man coming home, and he's, he's in this great ministry, it might be a great event. It doesn't turn out so good, as you know, if you know the story. Because the religious people didn't like what Jesus was saying. But this is what he, this is what, this is what got him in trouble, all right? I'll just, I'll just say it that way. Uh, Luke 4, 18 and 19. Unrolling the scroll, he, Jesus, found the place where it was written, God's Spirit is on me. And that place, by the way, is, is he quoted from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me. And so this is what Jesus says. This is what Luke tells us Jesus said. Uh, the, God's Spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor. Good news? That's what our story to begin with was about. Good news. How could it not be good news when you're starving to death and, and someone brings food to you when you have no wealth to get help or, 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 or any kind of change in your life? Someone comes along and gives you wealth. <laughs> It's good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce pardon to prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burdened and battered free, to announce this is God's time to shine. I love it. That's from the message version. This is not only what Jesus said, but it's what Jesus did. It's what Jesus did. The gospel is more than words and ideas. Diane and I were talking on the way in this morning and I told her what I was going to preach about she just kind of like uh, uh, okay okay I said so <laughs> so why is it this is the question for myself as well as for you why is it that we really don't value the gospel the good news of Jesus like we value property like we value bank account like we value windfalls <laughs> as we know them why and she said, well, it's because most of what we talk about in church is intangible. And she's absolutely right. And when Jesus came to this earth, he began by ministering to people, healing people, comforting people, raising the dead, casting out demons. Do you think any of that's happening today? I guarantee you it's happening today. Just because medical advances have come to the point where they can, where they can find solutions for sicknesses that back... 2,000 years ago, a person would have been dead. There's no hope at all. It doesn't mean it's any less of a miracle. It doesn't mean that God's not working through science or through our culture or through intelligence of, of people who have a heart, who have compassion on other human beings. That he's not working his miracles in many, many ways. It was tangible. It, it, he gave hope. He, he, he brought liberation. He brought healing. Belonging, relief. <laughs> I was thinking about the guy, that, you, you know, the guy who was, uh, couldn't walk. And Jesus at, is at, I think it's his mother-in-law's home, one of the family homes. And they were little houses, really little houses, and they had animals in there and everything. But this place was just packed with people because Jesus was there. Uh, having a, a, a healing service. And his friends, they, they saw they could not get in. They couldn't get through. So they went up on the roof and they busted up the roof, uh, roof and they let, his, let their friend down because it was a flat roof uh, structure. And, and if, you've wa <laughs> if you've watched uh, uh, the TV series on Jesus, The Chosen, thank you. My brain's, you know, uh, the chosen, you, you know that, you know, they could break up the, the palm fronds and, and the different things. They could let him down. They let him down in the middle of the room. How much do you think it was worth to that man when Jesus said to him, first of all, he said, your sins are forgiven. Evidently, this, this young man or this man had been struggling for a long, long time with amazing amount of guilt. And you all know, and if you're in a, a medical professional or, or a psychologist, you know what guilt can do to the, to the physical body. And for Jesus to come and say to him, your sins are forgiven. That was worth everything 
if, it, if nothing else had happened, he probably would have gone home happy with his friends. Huh. The religious people didn't like it because they said, how do you have the right to forgive sins? Who are you anyway? You can't forgive sins. He said, well, just to show that I can forgive sins. He turns to the young man and says, get up and walk. <laughs> and he did. He was healed. How much do you think that that was worth to that, that person? Later on in Jesus' ministry, the disciples of John came to Jesus. They were worried about whether or not Jesus was the Messiah. John's in prison. Jesus is out, you know, going through the countryside of Judea and, and uh, all, all over. And so they, they came and he said, look, just follow me. So they spent at least a day with him seeing what he did, seeing how he interacted with people, seeing how he healed. Matthew 11, 4 and 5 says, Jesus told them, go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. Amen? The good news is being preached to the poor. Sometimes we, we forget that it's the poor that we need to start with. That's where Jesus started. What would you give? Talk about the value of the riches of God. What would you give to see your dying child healed? What would you give to get the use of your legs back or to have new legs because you'd lost them? What would you give to be rid of a terminal disease or to be forgiven the public humiliation of adultery, to be reconciled to your estranged family? What would you give to be free of demonic addiction to drugs, alcohol, or pornography, or food, or even religion? What would you give to be set free if you were in prison, to be pardoned if you were condemned to die? How valuable would those things be? How valuable is the gospel? How rich are the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit? I tell you, they are beyond quantifying. They are beyond belief, beyond the bank account of the richest billionaire, billionaire on planet Earth. Here's the amazing thing that we can get from this story. We're just like those, those lepers. We, we read this story and go, like, those poor guys, are, you know, their skin's falling off and who knows what else. And they were in rags and nobody wanted to be around them. And, but do you know that, that sin is a greater disease than leprosy? And every single one of us has been born into and we by our lives have, have proven that we are sinners. Paul says in Romans 3, how many have sinned? He's quoting from the book of Psalms or from the, the collection of Psalms. How many have sinned? No, oh, that's, that's enthusiastic. So you're an exception, huh? All have sinned. If you don't know that you've sinned, read the Gospels and you'll find out. When we match our lives up against the perfect, beautiful love of Jesus Christ, we realize how fall, far we fall short. All have sinned. We're just like those, those uh, lepers. Just like them. We're far from the goodness of God. But we have before us the treasure of heaven. And we are not only partakers of God's riches of grace, we become, if we choose, if we accept, we become the messengers and distributors of that same grace if we accept it, if we accept Him. I love this verse in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It says, treasure is kept in clay jars. That's how they kept treasure in Paul's day. Many people did. You know, they had their jewels and their gold and their whatever. And that was their wealth. And so they'd keep it in clay jars. In the same way, we have the treasure of the good news in these earthly bodies of ours. That, that shows that the mighty power of the good news comes from God. It doesn't come from us. We're just the, we're just the re, uh, uh, receptacles of God's grace. And as we own that and as we celebrate that and as we share that, people begin to realize, no, it's not about you, it's about him. Remember the woman at the well? That was the first sermon that Pastor Jonathan preached here. She, she, she understands who Jesus is, 
and she goes back and tells all of her friends and her family, I found the Messiah, or he's found me. He's found me. And they come based on her word, and then after listening to Jesus, they said, we, we realize it's, it's not about you, it's about him. <laughs> it's about Jesus. The good news comes from God, it doesn't come from us. Next, new and now. I've been thinking a lot about that as Pastor Jonathan has been going through this series. A lot of things have happened in the past. Recent past, ancient past. I'm talking about for Vallejo Drive Church now. Or for any of you in your church experience if this isn't your home church. But it doesn't matter what's happened in the past. The only thing we need to worry about from the past is how it's taught us to draw closer to God in the present, right? Let's put it aside. Let's put it away. Let's focus on the new. What's new? What is God doing today? Where is he going today? Where is he leading us now, today? Yeah, now. <laughs> right now. What does God want for you and for me as his people? And here's a question for you. Why is it if we have such a great windfall the kingdom of, heaven, of the kingdom of heaven, why is it that we don't share that windfall with others like these lepers did with their city? We have all kinds of reasons. Um, one of the things I love about being on a, a multi-staff pastor is that we get to sit around and discuss things. And we, we pretty much don't fight. Sometimes one person is pretty sure that their idea is the correct one and no one else's is, but that's all right. We don't fight. But I, I love discussing the scriptures, and so we're talking about this story, and Pastor Jonathan immediately begins to think of, of how, can we, how can we line up the four lepers with four reasons why people don't share the good news. <laughs> and he found them. I'm not going to share it for you because I know he wants to preach this sermon. And maybe next week he'll fill in all the details that I left out. I don't know. But that's okay. That's okay. But there's, there are reasons, we have reasons, and a couple of them are, first of all, we're afraid. We're afraid of what other people might think. I heard of a, a, a member in our church who, who uh, recently, in, the, in a worship service, was so inspired by what was being preached that this individual wanted to just stand up and shout hallelujah, or something like that, but didn't, because this person was afraid of what other people might think. Oh, God, please take that kind of uh, fear out of this church so that we can be free to, to, to share the goodness and the grace of God. And as we worship God, to just let him fill us. Stop trying to control God and let him control you. That's one thing. Then there's another thing that's just sinful nature where we just want to keep it to ourselves or we just don't care. It's like a, one preacher said, when you don't share the good news with people in your neighborhood or in your, in your circle of influence, you, you might as well just tell them, I don't care if you go to hell. Now, I know he wasn't an Adventist, but that's okay. It's, uh, you know, it's basically all the same because hell is living or being not alive without God for eternity. But the third one is the one that I think is the greatest reason, and that is because we just don't value the gospel. We don't place the value on it that we place on things in this world. When we realize the true value of the good news of Jesus Christ, we will be a fearless and in, as fearless and intentional as those lepers were in going back to the city and telling the people there's food for everyone and riches beyond belief. Riches beyond belief. Here's the vision Jesus gave to the church, to this church in every part of the church of Jesus Christ. You, he says in Matthew 5, you are the light that gives light to the world. A city that is built on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, you should be a light for other people. Live so that they will see the good things you do. Live so that they will praise your Father in heaven. Do you ever think about that? We always say, well, it's not what I do. It's, you know, we don't want to want to talk about our works but Jesus says live so they'll see your good works because if we're living in Christ 
our good works, they come from the goodness and the riches and the wealth of God, from the security and the hope that God puts into our hearts. And we're not going to be saying, oh, look at us. Look at our church. We just fix the bathrooms. Come and worship with us. That sounds silly, doesn't it? Or we got new carpet now. Or, or we painted the, the fellowship hall, which is beautiful. All of it needs to be done. Don't misunderstand me. But this is just a house. This is just, a, as the early Adventists would call it, it's a meeting place, a meeting house. They never called it the sanctuary. They never called it a temple. Because they knew, the early Adventists knew, the New Testament teaching was that you and I together, we are the temple of God. God dwells in us as his people. And so if this place didn't exist and we were together, we would be the temple of God, the temple of his grace to the world. A habitation, a holy habitation for God to dwell on this earth and to express his love to others. A city on a hill. I like that. A church on a hill. A church on a hill full of God's grace. This one church, just think if God were to really capture our hearts in this place and we shared it with other churches and, 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 and Southern California begin to light up like a Christmas tree with God's grace. The good works are amazing things that happen when we discover the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. We learn what gifts he has given us and we use them in ministry. And there's so many gifts. We don't have time today. In fact, I, I would love to teach a, a whole class on this, on spiritual gifts and how we can discover them and how we can implement them in our lives and how we can let God use us in them. Gifts of quilting. We have some quilters here that give beautiful quilts to families with at-risk babies gifts of leading. We're having nominating committee finish off and we're talking about leadership in the church and teaching. Sound tech. I don't know what we would do without the sound tech in this place. Giving us, giving us the ability to be heard not only here in this space but worldwide. Graphic design. Steve, uh, a graphic designer who's offered his talents to Pastor Jonathan. He was very generous in offering it to me this we can, he designed our, our look today. Gifts of, of prayer, of healing, and so much more. Each of you, Peter says in 1 Peter 4, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. And so my disciples will do the same. But beyond all of that, all the gifts, all the goodness, all the riches, and the inheritance, and God's holy power, they're all wrapped up in one person. Because God's grace is most perfectly revealed in Jesus Christ. Paul says this in Colossians 2. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body, so you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. And, and, and I, want you, I want you to know, if you don't quite get why this is so important and why this is so valuable, it's okay. Just go to the Word. Let God reveal it to you. Let Him open your mind, open your heart. And when you realize that all the fullness of God is in Jesus, the man, Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, and as we receive him through the Holy Spirit, that fullness of God comes into us. How big is God? How powerful is God? God is everywhere. He's throughout the infinite universe. And he has given you and me the privilege of sharing the goodness of his character with the world. So here's two questions I want to leave with you today. First of all, do you realize what you've been given? as followers of Jesus Christ? Do you realize what you have been given? What do you have in your hands? What do you have in your heart? What do you have in your bank account or in your home? What has God given you? 
What do you have in your understanding of God and his grace and his goodness? And then what are you doing with what you have? What are you doing with what you have? Don't wait for somebody to give you permission. Go serve as God directs you to serve. Go help where there's a need. Jesus is the hope of humanity. Jesus is the one name above all where there is salvation and eternal life. And he said this. This uh, verse is not correct. It's from the Gospel of John, I think. But he said this. When I am lifted up from the earth, when I am lifted up from the earth, then all of humanity will be drawn to me. And our elder, uh, Doug, shared with me just before the sermon, he said, yeah, and, and I think that means more than just humanity. It means the whole universe. Because the universe needed to see this unbelievable revelation of God's love to people who despised him, to people who mistreated him, to people who killed him. They needed to see how far God would go and still goes to, to bring any one of us into salvation. When I am lifted up from the earth, then all of humanity will be drawn to me. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward right now. This is the key. This is the key. This is where it all starts. If you're struggling with the value thing and you don't quite get it, or if you want to know more, or if you want to find the, the, the power and the presence and the riches of God in your heart, this is where you start. Focus on Jesus. Look to Jesus. Who he is. What he has done. What he is doing. What he is offering to every single human being on this planet. He is the hope of the world. And as the church repents, yes, we need to repent. As the church repents and rediscovers him and lets him be the center, just like we sang last week, Jesus be the center. Let's him be the captain. Let's him be our savior, our healing, and our help. Then the church, the church becomes, the body of Christ becomes the hope of the world. We have the treasure that can save and redeem lost people who are loved by God. In this most amazing windfall that we could ever have and ever experience, you bring everything. You tell us if we have a need, we can come before your throne and ask for it. You just want us to ask. You want us to come. You want to be with us and have us be with you. Oh God, strengthen our hearts as we go from here into this coming week. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your presence, for your Holy Spirit. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people say, Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Saturday.